We need everybody. Okay, welcome everybody to Murray Amateur Radio Club's Thursday. Um, I guess this is the third Thursday uh, presentation, and we are going to talk about wilderness protocol. And again, this was something that uh, Steve uh, KG7GIT brought to my attention, and I went through it, and I go, you know what? This looks like something that everybody should know. So I am going to go ahead and start the presentation and I'm going to be clicking around because I always have to change my display settings and swap uh, swap my uh, display around. Now I'm going to share my screen and screen one. And uh, does everybody, uh, uh, Jan, just tell me if you see the, uh, my screen. Yep, looks good. Okay, great. So let's go ahead and begin. The Wilderness Protocol is something that actually has been around for a while in the late uh, 90s, and we're going to talk about that. And it is actually something that could save your life or the life of another. And because of this uh, protocol. As a matter of fact, it's a very simple protocol. It's something that uh, we really ought to um, pass the word along, if you will. So why is that not changing? Okay. So we're going to talk about what it is, uh, just a little bit about the history and how can it help me. Uh, and again, I want to thank Steve for bringing this uh, up to my attention because I think it is very, very important. So what is it? It is basically a methodology or a protocol uh, to ensure emergency communication in areas where uh, your repeater coverage may not be all that great or in the unlikely event of your local repeaters being off the air, uh, we're able to uh, implement this protocol. Uh, it's typically done in a, an emergency situation. And so that's the first part of this. The purpose is to <coughs> offer stations outside uh, or without repeater range capability uh, an opportunity to be heard when needed the most. And uh, it's called the wilderness protocol because it's typically done when you're out hiking, four by four groups will use it or should use it. Um, if you're hiking with scouts or alone or with your significant other or with a group, it is something that uh, is typically done in the wilderness. So that's where your lack of repeaters are going to be not found, if you will. The uh, wilderness protocol uh, is that uh, the amateur radio operators like us, we uh, monitor the uh, simplex channels at specific times in case of an emergency or priority calls. And that's really the gist of that. The protocol is that if you're not hiking and if you're um, just on the road, um, listen to the uh, simplex frequencies uh, that are designed for the, in particular, the national calling frequencies uh, in case someone is actually calling on that. And, and then we'll get a little bit more detailed of of that. And so the primary frequency to monitor is uh, the national frequency of uh, 146520. And you can also listen to if you have a, uh, a 10 meter, I mean a 6 meter or a, a 1.25 meter or a 70 centimeter or a 23 centimeter uh, radio, you can listen to the um, national call in frequencies. Uh, on those. Now, if you recall, this 146520 and uh, for the 70 centimeter 446000, they are a dedicated simplex frequency 
that you typically uh, will go ahead and monitor. And uh, as a matter of fact, let me give you a case in point. When I go out on the road, I'll go ahead and, uh, you know, drive and my license plate says N7XDL, or I'll put that uh, call sign on my, you know, back window. And another ham radio operator, as they pass me, they see that, oh, there's a ham radio operator there. So what is going to happen? If he wants to talk to me, he'll probably go to the 14652 and uh, do a CQ on the, on the uh, vehicle with, uh, you know, identifying my, myself. And so that 14652 on the two meter side is the uh, frequency dedicated for that. Obviously, in the normal circumstances, when you are talking on the 14652, as soon as you make the contact, you're supposed to do what? You're supposed to QSY to another frequency or change to another frequency. Uh, this 14652 is not made for rag chewing, you know, just talking willy nilly. It's made to make the contact and move to another, uh, move to another frequency. So everybody who's a ham radio operator knows these frequencies, um, or at least they should. And in particular, when we're dealing with the wilderness protocol, this is key. As a matter of fact, we hope people know about these uh, frequencies because it's these frequencies that are used. So the idea, um, again, with the wilderness protocol is to allow communications uh, between ham radio operators that are hiking or backpacking in uninhabited areas or outside the repeater range, uh, a way to be heard. Obviously, you need two parts of a communication. You need the sender and you need the receiver. So it won't do the sender any good or the lost hiker any good if no one is listening on that. So I, that's why it's, a, it's important to follow the wilderness protocol, even if you're not the hiker. Um, incidentally, just like that note says there, it's not just for hikers or backpackers. It's available to anyone to use at any time assistance is needed. So you don't have to try to find a local repeater. You can uh, uh, go to the 14652 or 446000 and uh, call for help. And there's a way to do that. But before we go there, let's talk about the history. When I was first doing the research, uh, it first appeared in a, the ARRL QST article uh, in 1994. Uh, later, it was augmented uh, in an article in 1996 that uh, added, added things to the uh, uh, wilderness uh, protocol that was originally set up by, by William. And so it's uh, worth reading. But what I'm going to present here is exactly what is in the article. And that is, the article recommends that stations, fixed, portable, or, mo or, or mobile, monitor the primary and secondary, if possible, national simplex calling frequency. And here's the key. Every three hours, starting at 7 a.m. local time for five minutes. That's it. So at 7 a.m., you, uh, you listen uh, for the, uh, anybody on those, that frequency, uh, and then every three hours from then. Um, additionally, stations that have the power to do it, either they're mobile or they have uh, additional batteries, they could uh, monitor uh, for five minutes starting at the top of every hour or even continuously. Again, that depends on the type of radio that you have and, and your power source. So how can it help me? Well, very simple. There's an increasing number of uh, ham radio operators who are hikers. And maybe I should say there's an increasing number of hikers that are becoming ham radio operators. And they will always carry their HTs with them. I don't go... Um, out into the wilderness without an HT. There's uh, two problems with this. First, 
uh, without a customary protocol on an HT uh, radio, it's only usually useful when you're in uh, range of a repeater. And generally speaking, in wilderness areas, repeaters are, are can be hard to find. Um, and I was gratefully excited when I am in my property up um, in the Duch in Duchesne County, and with my HT, I can hit a couple of repeaters. So yes, it's in Roosevelt, and uh, but that's okay because if I can hit a repeater, then I can hit a lot of people. If you can't hit a repeater, this will, you know, really come into play. And uh, the second problem with the may you may not be able to find a repeater is the ba uh, the power that uh, your HT is uh, using. And as you know, when you're in the wilderness and you only have one battery, that power is precious. So uh, back country amateurs can't monitor continuously, much less monitor all the frequencies uh, for simplex and repeater operations. So um, they have to pick and choose when they use their radios. So this uh, protocol allows you to conserve battery juice and still contact help. Uh, this requires, like I said earlier, like I alluded to, you have to have the receiver on the other end. So others have to be using the wilderness protocol at, as well. So what should we do as a member of the Murray Amateur Radio Club? Well, because the wilderness protocol is such a great idea, there's a, a couple of fundamental rules that we need to follow anyway. And this is something that in other presentations was brought up, which I think bears, uh, it's important enough to uh, repeat it here. And that is, there's a couple of rules. Rule number one is in preparation for your hike, you never ever want to rely solely on a radio or mobile phone to get you out of trouble in the back country. Things can happen to your radio. Things can happen to your cell phone. You, your primary strategy must be self-sufficiency. You need to be prepared for the unexpected. And rule number two, uh, you really ought to know which repeaters are available in the area that you'll be hiking into. Uh, you need to know the frequency, offset, the CTCSS or the PL uh, tone. Um, you can go to the VHF Society's website that has information on all the repeaters uh, in the state of Utah. And for that matter, when I travel cross country, I find out uh, which repeaters are along the interstate uh, that I can contact. And so I'm, I actually talked to people. Last time I went to uh, uh, visit my son, um, I was able to talk to a bunch of people uh, just by knowing the repeaters that are, that, uh, are on my way. It takes a little bit of a, a forethought, but it's certainly worth it, especially when you're going out into the wilderness. And Ah, rule number three, monitoring the 14652 as much as possible is uh, very important for those of us that are heading out, uh, especially with fixed stations and mobile uh, stations that have a big battery. Um, so yes, very important rules to uh, abide by. Continuing, and this is kind of now. Let's ha let's discuss how we actually implement the wilderness protocol. We already know that uh, we need to monitor uh, the frequencies, the national calling simplex frequencies, every three hours starting at seven a.m. Okay, that that part is done. We then use the long tone zero, abbreviated as LITS long tone zero and and we're going to talk about what what that is uh, if you're in a you need assistant situation you can begin your call by sending this uh, tone three to ten seconds um, 
before your actual uh, signal for help. What this does is it allows people who are monitoring the simplex frequencies, hey, we got a tone here. That means somebody is in trouble. You know, uh, when you get the amber alert on your telephone, it's the same type of thing. You know what it is. You don't have to know what the amber alert is as far as the specifics go, but you will know uh, that it is a um, amber alert because it has a very specific tone to it. So how do you do that? Well, you, you have to set up your DTMF uh, tone and what you do is you push the zero button while you're transmitting and you do that for at least three seconds. Uh, and that is sending that uh, DTMF zero tone out on the air. So you have to be able to program that into your radio. You have to implement your DTMF tones on your radio to do that. Uh, once you do that, once you hold down your zero key while you're transmitting, then you can go ahead and make your emergency call. And this will help people who are listening uh, that this indeed is an emergency call coming through. So it helps them to know that uh, you're in trouble and to stop what they're doing and listen to the next things that's coming out of their radio. So I think it's very important that we remind people about the protocol. Uh, we need to probably talk more about it. It's uh, you know always a good thing to know. And like for me, it's great that I was reminded about it uh, because if you know you're not reminded about something like this, you know you never think about it. So so let's talk about the summary. There are the times. And oh, by the way, I have a PDF of this presentation I will send to uh, Jan so he can post that on the website as well. So you can, uh, if you're going to throw away this presentation, keep this summary page because uh, it has all the information there, including the times, uh, the primary frequency uh, that you're going to be monitoring, begin your call, about three to 10 seconds with uh, your DTMF zero. And then as we know, as ham radio operators, let's start by saying break, break, break. This is N7XDL and I need help. One thing to note, if it is a medical emergency uh, and it is serious, I would not use break, break, break. I would use Mayday, Mayday, Mayday. Um, that is the international distress signal and it works in the ham radio world just as well as it works worked on the Titanic um, or aircraft. It is uh, something that you only use when you really need it. And you know, if I hear a Mayday on the radio, guess what I'm gonna do? I'm going to tell everybody to be quiet and I'm going to get my phone out and I'm going to start dialing 911 because the next thing out of that after that mayday is is something that somebody could lose their life over. So break 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 is used for high priority calls. Maydays are used for you know a life and death situation. So don't be afraid to use it. And you continue that for five minutes. If you do not hear anything, people make the mistake of continuing to make that call. And, you know, then an hour after it's done, um, your battery is all exhausted and now nobody's going to come out to help you. So this is why we we uh, do a three hour time frame, 7 a.m., 10 a.m., 4 p.m., 1 p.m., 4 p.m., and 7 p.m. Uh, so you can just use your radio every five minutes because those are the times that people are going to be listening if they're following the wilderness protocol. Um, and after the five minutes, you want to conserve your battery life for that. So a couple of tips and tricks. And this is 
again, common sense stuff. Before you leave, tell someone where you will be and when to expect you back. Duh. But it's something that a lot of people do not do. And it's amazing how many rescues are are implemented, how many search and rescue teams are sent out simply because somebody, the person who is now in trouble, didn't tell where you would be and when to expect you back. Uh, tell these people that you're going to be using the wilderness protocol. That is key because now uh, these people can say, okay, he's going to be, if he has trouble, he's, we're going to listen to him at 7 a.m., 10 a.m., 1 p.m., 4 p.m., and 7 p.m. Uh, that's, that's when the best chance of getting a hold of this guy. Also, if you pass a ranger station and you're the one who's actually going to be hiking, stop and inform them where you'll be and when to expect your, uh, uh, your return. Also let them know of the wilderness protocol. I don't know how many U.S. Forest Service is familiar with the wilderness protocol. Uh, I'm going to find out next month because I'm going to be doing some TURT training, uh, the Timpanogos Emergency Response Team training in Provo. Um, and I'm going to find out from the uh, Forest Service if they know about the wilderness protocol. I think it's something that that uh, needs to be taught uh, by the U.S. Forest Service uh, and also uh, with, with TURT as well. So, okay, so this is before you leave, those uh, three simple things that you should uh, do. And these are, again, common sense. In the field, already be prepared for the worst. If you plan on spending, you know, if you think it's going to be a six-hour hike, Assume that you're not going to be able to get back to your car. Take uh, a little bit of a MRE, plenty of water, uh, something that you can sleep in and you're not going to freeze to death. Uh, especially, you know, these are one of those things where uh, you're in, you know, we live in the desert and people think in the summertime, the desert is hot all the time. Well, if you've ever been out in the desert, uh, on a hot day, well, it can also turn very cold at night. Uh, and so you need to be pre prepared for the worst. I'd much rather have that um, emergency blanket and not use it than need it and not have it. In the field, again, you want to try to find a location that has a higher altitude. So if uh, you do have problems, uh, during those uh, time frames, you want to try to make it to high ground. That's going to be your best uh, option to uh, do what? Well, we want to get our antenna as high as possible. Uh, the higher our antenna is, the, the longer our range will reach. And this is one of those things where, you know, using, uh, keeping that uh, roll up 300 ohm, uh, roll up J pole that we made in, in, in club meeting. That should be something that you should have in your in your pocket, in your fanny pack. You don't have to have it on your HT as you're hiking and doing that type of stuff, but have it with you because you can uh, throw that up in a you know with a juniper on a juniper uh, tree or something, and you know get it up high, and uh, that makes a huge difference in. Um, what you're, how you're able to contact uh, another person. So, and never, never, never say, what's the worst that could happen? Because I'll guarantee you <laughs> that you'll, Murphy, he is listening uh, to that. Uh, and if he hears it, well, I tell you what, it can get worse. So now it's time for questions. I'm going to stop sharing and let's let's talk about that. Does anybody have any questions on on what we've talked about? And um, Rosie, if you have a question, please uh, type it in the uh, in the chat. So, um, oh, somebody wanted to say something. If you want to go ahead, I can hold mine. 
Chris. Yeah, Dan, I was just going to ask if uh, these slides would be available. I do apologize. I was late getting into the uh, into the net. Yes, uh, these this will be on our uh, website. I have a PDF uh, that I've created. So uh, all of this information will, will be there in addition to this presentation in, in video format. Okay, so I had heard about this wilderness protocol a long time ago, but I was always, what I heard was that it was every hour. And I know you, you mentioned if you have the ability to do it every hour, but you should uh, definitely do it every three hours. And to me, that makes a lot more sense yeah. because you're, if you're doing it every hour, your battery's going to run out three times as fast. Right. So, yeah. um, so I thought that was a good, a good point. Uh, but if you have the ability to listen, I think you should still listen every hour just because, you know, if you're if you're not worried about your battery or anything, like you're on a mobile or something like that, it doesn't hurt to listen and monitor that frequency. In fact, all the time. And I do that when I'm like in the car, if I'm on a trip or something, I'll have my radio there and I'll have it turned on, but it's on that calling frequency. And my my wife doesn't like listening to the radio, my radio. Right. She likes listening to the music. Right. But, uh, but I have it there and I have it turned on and I just have it next to me in the car just uh, in case something comes up and it's not like I'm actively talking on the radio all the time, but, uh, but I do have it there. And I, I think it, it comes back to some parallels with the old channel nine on citizens band on CB. Mm -hmm. we, we used to always be told, Hey, when you first turn your radio on, put the channel nine and leave it there for a few minutes just to see if anybody's out there. But, you know, it was a case of, we never, we never had a specific time that you should be monitoring channel nine back in those days. But like the cops would monitor channel nine all the time. And, and, uh, back Highway in, patrol would. back in the seventies. Yeah. So, yep. uh, you know, that was a, a thing, right? So, yep. um, just, uh, an interesting, in my, in my research, um, the every three hours has always been kind of like the standard. And even in the 96 article or 94 article, it uh, talked about every three hours. But it also said that if you're able to, um, then, you know, every hour is, is a good thing because people may not know the wilderness, what the wilderness protocol is. And so at the very least, you'll have more ears listening if, uh, you know, especially if it's a, you know, someone's broken their arm or something, broken their leg and, and they need medical assistance, you know, I mean, I would be as a ham radio operator in the field, I would try be trying every hour. Uh, but the mistake, like I uh, said earlier, the mistake that people do is they'll try to transmit until their ba batteries are dead, you know, and uh, so that doesn't help anybody. So it's one of those things where you always have to be prepared for the worst, which means that you're going to like in in uh, the 7.5 earthquake that we are not yet experiencing, but we will. Our community has to take care of ourselves. There's no one that's going to, even in our neighborhoods, we have to take care of ourselves. The fire department, the police department, they may not even exist at that point, you know? Um, and so we have to deal with it, which means that it's would be very good idea. And this is something that hikers know anyway. If you're going out on a hike, uh, especially, and I'm not talking about a hike around uh, Wheeler Farm, you know. I mean, you can yell and somebody will hear you. I'm talking about, you know, you go up to, uh, you know, even Timpanogos, if you do those hikes, it's a, it's a trail that people are always there. You may have to wait 10 minutes for someone to drop by, but someone's going to get there, right? It's not as important to have a ham radio as a hiker doing that. Um, if they were smart, they would, because we're always monitoring the frequencies there. And so, you know, for TURT. But as a hiker, um, most certainly you need to, you know, no wilderness first aid. You need to 
assume that you're going to need extra water. You know, you, you need to assume this type of stuff. And if you don't, you're, you know, if you're relying on your ham radio to save you, you know, that's where things go bad really quick. Because it's that time when you drop the ham radio on a rock and it's no longer functional. Now what do you do? The wilderness protocol is, it doesn't work for you anymore, right? So what's, what's this, and this is a question for everybody, what's the thing that will save you at that point? If you have no means of communication. Yourself. And? Planning ahead. It's that talking to the rangers, uh, talking to your family, who they know when to expect you back. You may be out uh, stranded for a day or two. You know, if your hike was, uh, was you're supposed to be back uh, in eight hours and all of a sudden it's midnight, your family knows something is up if they haven't heard from you, you know? And so uh, the Rangers will already have been notified had you taken the time to notify them. And, uh, you know, help could already be on its way. It's, it's the hikers that, that uh, don't do that. You know, what, what's the famous hiker who uh, lost his arm because his arm was pinched um, in a, a boulder that came down? You know, I'll guarantee you he, I, he wished that he told somebody uh, where he was going, you know, the route that he was taking. Yeah, and, he was out there for like 127 hours or something like that. And it was, yep, yep. So, I see Vern has his hand up, by the way. So I think. Oh, uh, go ahead, Vern. Sorry about that. Well, a comment and a question. Uh, you were talking about uh, how much does an extra battery weigh? You know, if you're going to worry about losing your batteries, they're, they're pack a spare. Um, question. Exactly. I have heard of the uh, long tone zero before, but I really don't know much about that. Could you say something more about it and how you set it up and, and issue that call? Yeah, so the reason why they use the LITS, uh, L-I-T-Z, long, long Tone Zero, is to kind of make a point at the beginning of your Mayday call. Um, that tone, it's, it's very easy to, to disregard people talking on the radio because people are talking on the radio all the time. But if you hear a tone, and, and specifically, uh, in this case, we're using a zero, uh, the DTMF tone of zero, which is a combination of two tones, right? Then, then that will get your attention, or it should get your attention. And especially using this protocol, we use that same tone, uh, and when you actually uh, listen, you know, pick up a, a phone and hit zero and see what it sounds like, uh, that's what's going to go over the air. So to set that up, you have to actually program your radio to use DTMF tones, okay? Uh, it, by default, if you were to just transmit a zero on, on your phone or on your HT, nothing happens. So you have to get into the uh, programming and and set that up I think, Once you, I think that's radio dependent i know my kenwoods do the the dtmf automatically okay I, as long as i'm holding the ptt when i hit the buttons it's going to do the dtmf so yeah. right it may not be the case for every radio though yes ragnar um i've used that uh quite a few times the five two and mm -hmm. uh, I was told way early by, uh, oh, what's his name? Irv Green. Uh, he's, um, he set up the um, Lewis Peak repeater a long time ago, originally set up Heath Kit store. So anyway, he was my neighbor. And he, one of the first things he told me is whenever you go camping or go to a place, you want to um, check in, just say, this is N7 LCR, I'm at 5.2 listening. And you just do that when you go into a campground or some other thing. Anyway, um, 
I've also put uh, put it on APRS. Mm -hmm. uh, so when you're doing APRS, you know you can put in uh, monitoring five two, so which is good anyway. But um, and if you drive by somebody that's a ham, put up your hand, all fingers out, and go five two. It's most people will recognize that. So anyway, um, I was at Yosemite once, and um, there was several people uh, talking back and forth. And um, this was the first time I was there back in the mid, early 90s, I think it was. Anyway, um, there was somebody on top of one of the um, uh, climbs up there and they called out 5-2 and uh, one other person responded before I did, but uh, they needed help. And uh, they had been checking for a couple hours and um, they used that um, protocol and it helped them and um, yeah, I didn't really assist in anything, but I heard it, it happened and what happened, you know, that there was all but already somebody there, but it's, um, I, I know I doing the Tetons, I would always go up there and check and um, it, it felt good, you know, it felt good. I felt, um, I felt more comfortable if I, uh, knew I could contact somebody. Mm -hmm. you know? And I think you bring up a good point, Ragnar, and that is when you are setting up camp, you know, if you're out in the wilderness, go ahead and get on the 5-2. And for that matter, I would get on, if you haven't contacted anybody, uh, when you are setting up your radio and say, hey, this is N7XDL, I just want to, uh, I'm CQing to any uh, radio operator out there. Um, if you can hear me, I'd appreciate you, uh, you know, a response. And that way you know who your neighbors are, right? And exactly. you, you, you know that uh, now that they know that someone is there on the other end of the radio as well, you know? And so making that announcement and, uh, you know, again, saying, hey, I'm going to go uh, for that hike. I'm, you know, taking up this trail and, um, you know, I plan on being here. Uh, maybe a lat long uh, on, on, on a map you give them. And, you know, the more people that know where you're going, uh, you know, the better. Um, so, yeah, well, I, think, I think that's very important. Well, I remember the, uh, some of my earlier times, way before cell phone, uh, up to the Uintas with Boy Scouts. Mm -hmm. A lot of times it was their first night out away from anyone. So we'd... Uh, do um, phone patches. And I think the easiest phone patch there at that time was up into Ogden. I don't remember. It was like four, nine or something, uh -huh. or somewhere. I don't remember, but uh, you know, all it needed was one uh, call to a neighbor that was, ta you know, of the, the Boy Scouts that were up there to reassure the parents that they could contact uh, or the kids could contact them, you know, it's, right. um, it, it's this confidence thing that you have communications. It's, it's very nice to have that, especially if you play with it all the time, you know, it's, um, yeah. I think an interesting it, factor too, about the, the wilderness protocol, when you're away from the repeater, you can't get to a repeater if you can get to somebody else, they might be able to get to a repeater, even if they don't have cell phone service where they're at either, where they might be able to get to somebody else who's closer to a cell phone tower or something. So you can always relay. And I know that's something that we, you know, if, if you think about it, American radio relay league, that, that was what the whole thing was about was relaying messages. Right. So yep. uh, that it wouldn't hurt us to practice, uh, some kind of message traffic at some point and just, you know, get comfortable with doing that in case we ever have to do it in a real situation or called upon to do it. That, that actually happened today in the uh, 220 uh, simplex. Um, I had a couple relays because uh, I couldn't hear Ragnar and I couldn't hear Chris. And uh, I was able to uh, uh, get the information in 
via the relays. So I, and in an emergency, when, when there's chaos abound, you remember that HF uh, communication we, we had in one of those presentations where uh, it was all about relays, you know, getting into Puerto Rico or wherever it was. Um, I guess that was in uh, Louisiana. Um, yeah, so that's probably something we, we could probably uh, have a, a class on as well, how to relay. So anyway, anybody else have any comments or uh, questions on wilderness protocols? I do. It's kind of yes. a, a question kind of on subject, but off subject. Has anyone ever tried to uh, hook a small solar panel up to your HT battery to charge it like out? Out while you're hiking or anything. Uh, okay, 12 volts and your batteries are typically seven volts or they're looking for 10 volts or yeah. something like that. So you have to, you have to have a charger and this is what I'm doing right now. I am actively looking for battery chargers for all my radios that will accept a USB port. Uh, because if you can get USB, then it becomes very easy or some type of 12 volt uh, and they make 12 volt adapters for, for various, uh, you know, outputs that, that are required. So yeah, you got to be careful with that. I don't know. Actually, I do have one radio, one of my AC radios, it's looking for a 12 volt source. That would be my only radio that I could actually charge from a solar uh, because you're actually going into the charge controller. It's the charge controller that's connected to your battery, uh, and that would certainly work. But that needs to be – any, does anybody else have any suggestions on that? So I, I think you can get like um, – they have those – car power adapters, charger adapters, like, at least for the Kenwoods, I know they do. Mm -hmm. For the Kenwood handhelds, they have, it's got like the 12 volt plug. Yeah. The, and yes. you can plug that into your radio and charge your radio from the car power. And so if you had a, a solar panel set up that fed into one of those type of 12 volt outlets, you could probably plug that car adapter into it and charge a radio through that it would be a little inefficient i think but uh but it would be something you could look at doing right and if you can you know while you're hiking i guess i don't know if you're going to pack a solar panel around open and open to the sun while you're hiking but if you set up a camp or something somewhere you could maybe get a few hours of sun in and i don't know how much power you would get out of it to charge your radio up but uh but I know like from my wall charger, my handheld will take several hours to get a full charge out of it. So that, that may not be a viable solution, but it may be worth carrying a portable solar panel just you, in case, right? You also have those, uh, many battery, many radios will have a double A battery pack. Right. right. Uh, that might be worth, uh, you know, I think it was, uh, Burns. Actually, that that was more older school, uh, because the government used to hand out double A's to everybody. Like you could get um, almost any government agency had stacks of double A's. So mm -hmm. when I first started playing ham radio, everyone had got the uh, the packs to where you could put uh, double A or alkaline batteries in. Plus, I like them because you can have them sit around a year and uh, you'll still get more capacity or more uh, life out of them than you would your uh, rechargeable. One thing I have noticed, though, like on, on my Kenwood uh, 72, I have that battery pack that takes, I think, six double A's. But when, that, when I'm using that, I can only do low power transmissions. I can't do the the five watts i can only get like maybe a half a watt out of it so which is all the more reason to have an antenna that you can raise up as high as you can amen that was my second question dan you mentioned the roll up j pole mm -hmm. that you guys made that that was before my day can you maybe describe that slightly 
you know what a FM 300 ohm antenna lead looks like? Kind of like a pink wire? Like for a TV uh, antenna. It's like a TV antenna, yeah. The old TV antennas. It's basically two conductors that are about a centimeter apart that are just a long lead of that. Yeah. Anyway. From your it, expression, it, I can see you don't know what you're talking about. Yeah. <laughs> It's a it's a uh, uh, antenna wire that is very very cheap, um, and we made a J pull out of it. And actually, we made a uh, did we make it? Was it dual band? Because I have both. Yes, it was dual band. Yeah. Okay. So Sherwood, he's holding up a picture of it. Could you move that closer to your uh, and turn it on the edge so he can see what that three hundred ohm cable uh, move it up higher down low right there so it's kind of a translucent plastic material okay and, uh, i've seen it, that stuff yeah it's yeah, yeah. very common and you may even find it at kmart if there's uh or walmart uh fm antennas those are popular fm antennas uh you can get them on amazon um unfortunately nowadays the the conductors that are, you know, running parallel to one another, some of them are pretty, pretty cheap. And the, the wires are ultra thin and they just don't make it like they used to. Of course, we're sourcing everything from China now. And that's why we have the issues with that. But that's the type of antenna that I'm talking about. It fits in your shirt pocket and uh, you roll it up and uh, it makes a huge difference. It makes that half a watt on Jan's radio turn into a 10 water when you have the antenna up high and uh, you're able to transmit and receive. Uh, I mean, the antenna is everything. Um, I put a link in the chat to a, a plan for building those. If you want to check that out. So just on the... If you hit the little chat button at the bottom of your Zoom window, you should see it. Yeah, and Rosie, if you can uh, uh, click on that link, and it uh, is a PDF that uh, – now this is a – okay, so this is a dual band that uh, – he, he first talks about just a two-meter uh, version, which works fine, and it actually – is worth having in addition to the dual band version. Uh, it's a little bit more involved to create the dual band because you have to create a an electrical choke, as it were, uh, so that when you're transmitting on 70 centimeters, the radio does not see the rest of the antenna. Uh, but when you're transmitting on two meters, uh, the radio sees the entire two meters. Um, and but yeah, those are that's exactly the plans that we used um, in in our club to uh, to make that. So maybe we ought to go and uh, do this again if everybody's up to it. If we ever get a chance to meet in person, if we again. ever get a chance, there is that. <laughs> so so uh, Dan, uh, me and my dad, we bought some thicker ladder line. Some, so I guess 400 ohm been, uh, instead of the 450 ohm. It's it's standby. Yeah, it's like, like feed line. Yeah, yeah, line. yeah. Uh oh, this so, stuff. Like, yeah, yeah, like feed line. Probably. Yeah. I think it is. Yeah. It's about That's, an inch wide. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, this will do 100 watts on, uh, yeah, I have a 2 meter and a a 70 centimeter version uh, made out of this stuff. You can get that at T4 or... T9. Or T4 or T9, T or K4 or K9 TAX. He, he sells it. But uh, on the uh, internet, um, 
where all things can be had. You can make a, you know, I like the ability to do a, just a VHF version. Uh, those are really easy to make. And a little um, more robust too. You don't have to worry about it breaking. Yeah. Yeah. So that's what I would suggest, uh, you know, cause you're going to be listening to, you know, uh, 14652 anyway. Um, that's not to say that the 446 000 isn't listened to, but you know, when I'm out in the field, that's what I listen to. I listen to the two meter simplex. When I'm out on the road, when I'm driving cross country, I listen to the 52. I don't listen to the 440, uh, 446 000. Um, but that's just me, you know. So I think I'm going to make me another um antenna lead uh the dbj2 vhf antenna and uh just keep that with me so plus the thing about that is uh if you can get any extra height it multiplies your range tremendously on it yep yeah, the only drawback with this particular antenna is you have to carry the coax with you too. But if you use, oh my goodness, just one second. I'm making another antenna. Um, stand by, stand by. As a matter of fact, the antenna or the uh, coax that they use for the DBJ2, it's uh, the RG174, um, which is this stuff here. It's the real thin stuff. And because we're dealing with very low wattage, um, this stuff works great. And, you know, having a 10 foot length of this in your pocket is nothing you know, just like the antenna. So it's, it's a very, very wise thing to, uh, uh, to have this. And those, those J-Pole, BHF J-Pole antennas that you can make, those are cheap enough to make that if you were to lose it, like get it stuck in a tree or something and not be able to get it back down, it's not really that big of a deal, but, uh, it's a lot easier to walk away from it, huh? Yeah, than a, for sure. Than, than a nice, uh, diamond. Than a four yeah, <laughs> or or that that dual band from uh, T nine or T right, nine uh, right. or N nine TAX, you know that was like what thirty forty bucks. Right. Yeah. You, you know? don't. You're not going to want to walk away from that. But. Right. But yeah. So carrying a little uh, a rolled up VHF antenna like that and a length of rope or cord or something that you can throw over a tree branch or something like that to drag five, it. Higher. Yeah, five fifty cord. Yeah, with uh, you know, tie a rock to it or something. And you can huck it up over a branch and pull the antenna up so that it's nice and vertical. And uh, you know, you could really get some range out of something like that. Yep. Plus, up there, you don't have to carry a rock around. <laughs> Plenty of so, rocks. So around. true. <laughs> Just get one out of my head, right? So. <laughs> Well, they would be marbles, and I've lost all mine, so <laughs> I'd have to look for a rock. Uh, okay. Uh, well, that was kind of a fun, uh, a fun excursion, talking about the wilderness protocol. I want to thank everybody for joining. Uh, does anybody else have any uh, uh, comments before we stop the recording? Hearing nothing. Um, thanks, everybody. And we will talk at you next time. That'll be February 4th. <laughs>